again, my name is James Liao. I'm a co-founder of PK8. Let's talk about IoT a little because in the past, the campus network, I think all of us know, campus network has been seen as a, as a market that's not so interesting. Why is that? Because the speed is slower. It's not like, uh, like uh, uh, cloud computing that uh, the com cloud computing network could continue to grow, going faster and faster. But if you think about campus network, in the past 10 years, the campus network doesn't change much. The biggest change is that you bring Wi-Fi into the campus network. You don't have the, the, the explosive uh, growth of the staff. So campus network has been built for, for employees, right? You want to connect to printer, you want to connect to, uh, connect to certain things in the, in the system. And now it's basically just a connection to the campus so that you can get to the cloud. In the next couple of years, the biggest change in the campus network is going to be IoT. It's a, the campus network will become a place not only for employees to connect to the cloud, it will be a place for the IoT to connect to the cloud as well. So essentially, the campus network will become a hub for cloud, for IoT, and for, uh, for employees. The employee might grow like 10% every year, but your IoT might go 10x every year. So the challenges of the, the IoT is going to completely change the way people think about uh, building the campus network. Right now, campus network is still pretty static uh, that you have, a, you have a, a book that tell you that build three tiers of, uh, of a network. You go from access network, then you build the aggregation network, you build a core network. Each layer of network use different protocols, use different models, use different, uh, different, different software modules and be managed in different way. In our goal, that all these things are becoming the barrier for people to adopt, um, adopt IoT. Because one, it's a one network. You deal with the network when IoT connect to the network, if they can get into the network, they can go anywhere. So let me share a, a, a very interesting story. I think this is something that uh, a lot of audience probably have heard of. In 2018, there was a pretty uh, famous hack that, uh, in, the, in a big casino, they have this huge fish tank with beautiful fish inside, and they attract a lot of people to come to the lobby to admire the fish tank. So in 2018, they introduced this smart temperature sensor inside the, inside the tank, and they will measure the water quality, they will measure the oxygen inside the water. So this temperature sensor is, uh, this is a pretty interesting thing that uh, help the hotel to uh, help the casino to manage the, the fish tank. And long behold, somebody find a loophole to the temperature sensor. This sensor is sending data to a controller inside the network. So they hack into the, the temperature sensor, get into the casino network, eventually find 10 gigabyte of customer data and then blend the data into a format like a video upload, send it over to Finland's data center and eventually they leave the, the, the casino without a trace. This was a pretty interesting case that shows you that when people start to build a network, they build it for human. They actually have the neck access inside. Every, uh, everyone that comes with the notebook or comes with, uh, with a cell phone, you go into the casino, you want to connect to the network, they will qualify you. They will see, oh, this is devices for this, this is devices for this network. But when you connect the IoT, you don't, these IoTs are dumb. They don't have an identity. So they connect to the network, they are thinking, well, these are dumb devices. What can you do about it? Guess what? When you hack into this dumb device, a device, eventually they figure out a way to get the, the data out of your, your server. And it could be even worse than that. Uh, I think in 2019, there was another example that um, somebody figured out that the majority of the security surveillance camera is still running default password on the surveillance camera. If you have a surveillance data uh, camera at home, think about whether you have ever set the password on the surveillance data uh, camera. So eventually they get 100,000. No, I didn't miss a zero. It's a 100,000 surveillance uh, camera 
to launch a DDoS uh, attack at the same time and bring down half of the DIS server in the East Coast. So that's, uh, that's how IoT is going to change the people's way of using the network. Uh, and why is this so, so difficult for, for campus to handle the IoT? Because one, the growth rate is really, really high. When you need to deploy, you need to deploy a lot of IoT at the same time. Two, these IoT devices are not like a notebook or, or uh, your cell phone. You can install software to identify who is using it. They are not associated to humans. So basically, and, and three, they are so simple that they basically is plug and play. So if you don't have a security way to secure your network, you are basically just opening up your network for anybody to hack into. So how do we solve the problem? We have to solve the problem in four ways. The first one really is that to deal with the, the growth of the IoT, you need to introduce automation into the network. That's the most basic one. If you don't have an automation way to, to configure the IoT, to configure the policy, you don't have a way to deploy it. You cannot have somebody to carry a camera and then have another network engineer following them to make sure that all the configuration is done. No, you cannot do that. So automation is the first one. Secondly, you really need to separate the network, the virtual network from the underlay network. You cannot say, oh, I have a camera come into my network, so I'm going to configure a VLAN on my network. Everything you do on your your uh, underlay network, it can bring down the whole network. You cannot change the configuration anytime, uh, all the time. So what you need to do is that you need to separate the virtual network from the hardware, or from the physical uh, underlay network, so that when you are doing things on the virtual network, you don't impact your, your underlay network. The third one, the most importantly, is that you need to have a strategy for the security. And this is the thing that we think the software is going to play a big role in this whole thing. We are developing new technology every day to try to help our customers to accelerate the deployment and increase the security of the IoT. And not the least, uh, last but not the least, when you deploy the IoT, after you do the deployment, everything is working. You really have to have analytics plug into the place so that you know what these devices are doing. And you cannot have uh, somebody sit over there to watch the data. You need to have a software to analyze the data for you. So these are challenges we're seeing in the campus. A lot of innovation has to go into campus to solve this problem. And this is different challenge from cloud. In the past, the cloud is all about scalability. How do you get more bandwidth? How do you get more device, uh, more servers into the, into the cloud? IoT is the next challenge that it's going to solve features, virtualization, security, analytics, all these things have to go into the campus and it has to be integrated with the cloud because majority of the IoT controller will be run in the cloud. Campus has become a very you know flexible term these days. We've talked about this before at, at NFT with you know with the way things are in the world and you know organizations evaluating you know whether or not they're going to you know bring their their campuses back. So in a lot of campus networks, we see they're you know going into not just a people campus, but you know places where you need lots of switches. Where are you seeing your customers um, you know put this infrastructure to solve you know problems like IoT and, and enterprise campus? What are, what are some of the use cases that you're seeing in the real world? Uh, there are a lot of use cases about uh, about IoT devices going into building. The, the easiest one, and this is probably not the the first one to adopt the. Well, actually, let's start with the the most obvious one, in the factory, in the manufacturing factory. This is where you used to have a people to work in the factory, and the, the network is only supporting for for human to upload the data sometimes, or even some of your your notebook has to connect to the network. Now with all the, all the manufacturing going, autom uh, going automated with the robots in the place, you can imagine every single thing, even down to the screwdrivers that you are collecting data, how much torque you are putting on the screwdrivers and how many rounds of uh, screws are going into a uh, highly sensitive uh, engine like uh, the airplane engine, right? So these are the things that will go into the, the network. And, not only that, if you are thinking about the campus network like a, a typical big enterprise uh, campus, 
uh, people might not go into campus that often, but they still have to go to, into campus for meetings, for meeting with customers, uh, doing the presentation, doing demos, for example. And more and more things have to go into the campus because you have less people working on the campus. You really don't want to have a doorman over there to say, are you customer or you are employees, right? So you have the, the, the car key that you can open the door when the customers come in, they don't have to deal with the, the, all the registration system. They have their, their cell phone with the invitation. They scan the cell phone and then you know who they are. Are they into the campus at the right time? They go into the campus. You have the instruction, tell them that which, uh, which uh, conference room to go. All these things require IoT in place. And a lot of people will say, okay, these IoTs are mostly controlled through Wi-Fi. Not true. Most of the IoTs will require power will require secure connections. So a lot of IoT devices actually require you to connect to the, uh, to the PoE ports, for example, and need to have a network access control to qualify the IoT before they can be plugged into the network. Yeah, so I'm so specifically in the because I've, I've built operational technology networks in manufacturing before. So I'm curious, mm -hmm. what is it, um, what are you seeing that your clients are choosing in that space, in the manufacturing space or in the industrial space? Of, of why are they choosing to put PK8 into those environments over, say, you know, Cisco, since you guys had mentioned Cisco previously? Mm -hmm. Because the, the, the first thing they want to make sure is that, hey, I have the existing infrastructure already, right? So it's built for human, but now I need to put these things into the environment. Do I really want to talk to Cisco and then completely overhaul my network and then build a new one just for IoT? Or can I add something to my campus right now and I have the software to do the next uh, application. So for example, we have a customer who is uh, building the whole network with uh, a lot of Cisco switches, but for the Wi-Fi side, they use Aruba. And they use Aruba for, uh, for NEC controller. So now they want to add a lot of IoT devices, so they, they need a lot of PoE switches. So they are in the dilemma. Do I go with Cisco to get the PoE? Or do I go with Aruba? Aruba doesn't have a very good PoE device uh, and a lot of limitation on the device. So on, on the switches, so should I go with Cisco? If I go with Cisco, now I'm going to apply NAC on the Cisco switches. Can Aruba, uh, Aruba controller work with Cisco switches? And we don't have that problem. We basically tell people that you can just use PKA with a white box switch. It could be coming from Dell. It could be coming from, from Edge Core. You put it into the place, you do the testing. I guarantee you it's going to work with Aruba controller and I guarantee you, it will work with Cisco infrastructure. And it provides the PoE function you need. It provides the NAC function you need, even help you with the automation, all those things. It's just so helping them. integrate multi-vendor environments is what you're after. That's the target market for PK8. Yes. And, okay. and that actually goes back to the key point that we're a software company. For the software, uh, software uh, industry, the most important thing is that you can integrate with other software. And that's the difference between the software and the hardware. Most of the hardware vendors, they are so fascinated with the, the, the integration with their own software and their own hardware. They just don't play well with any software or any other vendor's product. So I'm just curious. So if you have, you, know, you have a company that say, you know, Cisco shop and, and they've decided mm -hmm. that prices are too much and they're gonna go white box sure. and then use your software. From an admin standpoint, what's the is there a relearning that they have to do? How how hard is that? Ah, good. So first of all, uh, all PKA switches come with uh, come with a, a CLI that's easy to use. I just mentioned about that, and they have uh, all the APIs that they can integrate into the existing infrastructure. So you don't have to worry about that. Uh, but even more interestingly is that we have this uh, this MCon controller that provide you the easy to use GUI operation. It's basically a point and click type of operation, uh, operation environment. So from customer's point, uh, if you want to deploy the switches, you have to, you have to uh, automate your process. And in the past, the biggest problem is that you have to learn how to set up every, uh, every uh, device, set up the configuration from ground zero. We don't do that. We help our customers put things done. Of course, for some of the customers, they really prefer to go into the CLI to control the network 
and that we provide the COI to do it. So from our perspective, I, I think we are focusing on the right thing because we have the controller on the top income controller to help people with the automation. And inside the, inside the network, you use Picos on any layer you want to use. You can use it on access, you can use it on aggregation, you can use it on core, and we give you virtualization. We collect the, the telemetry data, we can upstream the data, and even more importantly, we integrate all the security in, in our software. You can enable network access control, you can enable policy inside the software. You don't have to worry about, do I deal with Cisco model 4,000 or Cisco model 9,000? It's the same software. If you look at the diagram, this is the, the diagram that we have built the virtualization map with, uh, with our customer. This is deployed into the real environment. What is the important about this one? It's a basically virtualization all the way down to the access layer. So, which means that when you connect the device to the network, you don't see the network. You, when you connect the device to the network, you see the point that, that you want to go to. And not only we, we deploy the VSLAN, uh, the EVPN inside the campus, we actually deploy into the data center as well. So now your data center looks like a part of your campus. This is what we believe the future is. The cloud and the edge will merge together. The device come into the network, they start to see the point they want to go to instead of seeing the cables that they have to follow, okay? Not only that, we also have a, have a security for network access control. This is the, the thing that the people, uh, people really need when you, they deploy IoT into the device. And we have uh, interoperability with the Aruba, with the Cisco Eyes, even with the open source PackyFence and a lot of other, uh, other controllers as well. So this is what people want. And, I'm going to use uh, one simple example to show that even if you don't have virtualization, how people are desperate enough that, that they have to solve the problem in the current environment. We have one customer using NAC to control the, the device. That when the device come in, they have to be qualified. Once you qualify them, they want to make sure the device, if it's hacked, it doesn't go around the, the network. So they build this really sophisticated uh, PVLAN architecture to make sure the IoT device can go only one direction. So this is one of the solutions. So it depends on customer's appetite. Uh, you, can use, uh, you can use NAC and, and PVLAN to limit where the, the traffic is going, or you can use virtualization to make sure some of the traffic can only go to a certain point. And we're developing a new exciting technology that we will come back a little bit later to show you that we're gonna completely uh, make the, the network transparent. So when the device comes in, they have only one place to go. So for example, if you have a, a sensor plugging into the network, the sensor only sees the controller. They don't see the network and they cannot go around the network because they don't see anything else. And this is, totally uh, virtualized is totally automated. And this is one of the things about uh, network monitoring. This is a traditional network market, marketing, uh, network monitoring tool that we, uh, our customer use in their network by using very, very legacy SAMP to collect the data. But we have other customers using very, very advanced tool as well. They use a GNMI, GRPC to collect all the uh, a big amount of data out of the network. And it's a basically all the statistics of a control plane, data plane, even virtualize the network traffic as well. They can pick and choose what kind of flow they want to, want to monitor and then collect the data using the new advanced the big data analysis tool. And these are the tools that don't develop, uh, these are not developed by us. These are developed by other independent software vendors. And those vendors, we just provide the interface for them to integrate with us. This is the beauty. The beauty of the software defined network is that now you can have software to work together so that you don't have to have the human sit between the network, uh, sit between the software to say, okay, you generate the data for me. I write a script and then I feed the data to other software. 